So we're uh, reading from the Bhagavatam about Narada Muni. This is after he saw Krishna and his experience. This is what Prabhupada's describing. It's not a mechanical process. One should simply await the opportune moment and go on discharging his prescribed duty and devotional service of the Lord. Narada Muni thought that the Lord could be seen again by the same mechanical process which was successful in the first attempt. But in spite of his utmost endeavor, he could not make the second attempt successful. The Lord is completely independent of all obligations. He can simply be bound up by the tie of unalloyed devotion. Nor is he visible or perceivable by our material senses. When he pleases, being satisfied with the sincere attempt of devotional service, depending completely on the mercy of the Lord, then he may be seen out of his own accord. So, basically what happened was Narada saw Krishna by his meditative process and then by Krishna's will, he decided to... Uh, his own will decided to leave because he was kind of giving Narmani an impetus. But he then he told him, "You're not ready yet." But Narmani didn't understand that, so he went back into meditation, did the same thing, see Krishna, but now Krishna wasn't there. So Prabhupada's making the point: it's not a mechanical process. And a lot of times when devotees do japa, they approach it more mechanically. Am I pronouncing properly? Am I sitting properly? These things help, but that's not the essence. And so the essence is the devotion. The essence is, essence is always devotion. It's never mechanics. Mechanics are just um, how you externally manifest, or the the, the um, mechanics are like the rules. You know, you're on the road. So stay in this lane, stop at the red light, and so forth. But that's not the real, that's not what driving, you know, teach me how to drive. Stop at the red light, stay in the lane. I haven't taught you how to drive, I've just taught you the rules. Driving's a different. So, so the mechanics of what we do is not what pleases Krishna, but it's the consciousness. But you have to stay in the lane, and you have to stop the red light, otherwise you can't drive. So you have so you follow these rules. This is the etiquette. This is how you manifest your service to Krishna through certain forms. But the devotion is the essence. So then, Narada went more into the mechanical side. So Krishna is saying that it's it's really a relationship. And as we know from nectar of devotion, Krishna says he withholds himself because once he gives himself, he becomes controlled. So he's not going to give himself so easily. And we won't give ourselves so easily also. So he's not going to be captured by a mechanical process that doesn't attract him. He's captured by the bhakti and the love of the devotee. You know, just like in Vaikuntha, the service is done more based on the rules. So that's a different relationship. And so in Vaikuntha, the Vaikuntha Okay, it's it's rule rules is what guide guides everything. But in Braj, it's heart which guides everything. And so we're developing that mood. Spontaneous attraction. Rag. So that's that's when Krishna fully manifests himself. So it's you know, it's love. So Narada Muni's working on the mechanical side. If I just do this, Krishna will appear. You know, so, so, so sometimes Prabhupada says, if you chant 16 rounds and you follow the regular principles, you go back to Godhead. But it's qualified. And, and one of the qualifications is how you do it, and the other qualification is the result you'll get by doing it correctly. So yeah, if you chant 16 rounds correctly, you follow the regular principles, you have the right attitude, then you'll get love of Krishna, and then you go back to Godhead by that process. But just by chanting mechanically, well, particularly chanting offensively, then it won't produce the result. It can't. It can't be 16 rounds offensively, and you'll go back to God. Now, one might say, "Well, if I chant offensively, then someday I'll come to the offenseless, p 
pure stage. That may be, it may not necessarily be. But the main point is it's not just, okay, I just do this mechanically because because that chanting and that service is meant to soften the heart and that's that's what devotional service is. It's it's the it's the affection. It's, it's the nature of the heart. So so it's like it's like Krishna is saying here, if your heart is not there and you just do the process, you won't get the result. But I gave you this darshan as an impetus to know what lies ahead. But you're not you're not ready for it. So in our Krishna consciousness, in our devotional service, then you find this this state, this position that sometimes Krishna shows some mercy and we get some realization. And sometimes the realization comes in a way that maybe we don't full, we're not fully qualified to, to have that realization or understand it, but Krishna's given it to us to push us forward. And often we find that the realization doesn't remain. You know, I had this realization last week I was doing very well, but this week I'm not. I don't know where those realizations went. Because those realizations were helping me, I was doing fine, and this week, not doing fine. That's because we're not on that stage that the realization, that the realization was on a certain level of Krishna consciousness. So it gave us insight into that level, but if we're not on that level, we can't maintain that realization. But when you're on that level, then you can maintain it. So if Narada Muni at that point were on a higher level, then he would have had constant darshan of Krishna. But Krishna just gave him something of a higher level. But he said, you're not on this level yet. So, you know, we will dance ecstatically in a kirtan, right? But it's not that we're always feeling ecstatic like that. So the ecstasy, that's real. It's transcendental. It's coming from the holy name. But until we're on a higher platform, we won't always feel that ecstasy when we're chanting. And sometimes we chant and we don't feel it. So it's not that what we experience is not real, it's not genuine, it is. It's just we're not on that level. It was We were put on that level through a practice or a process. Right? So you can experience, let's say, great attachment for the deities. Right? But would you be able to worship the deities 18 hours a day? Well, you say, I like to do deity worship for a half hour. I get a lot of inspiration. I like to read Bhagavatam for a half hour. I get a lot of. I like to chant for a half hour. I get a lot of inspiration. So that means they're not yet on the level of ruchi. But there's some ruchi there. When I do it, I get some taste. But I couldn't do it all day. I need to go out and do other things. You know, so... So some ruchi, some realization, some taste, something is there, but it's not on the level where I could just be fully absorbed in doing this ecstatically, hour after hour after hour. You know? So that's what's happening. So next verse. Let's see if anybody came by chance. No. Um the next verse. Seeing my attempts in that lonely place, the personality of Godhead, who was transcendental to all mundane descriptions, spoke to me with gravity and pleasing words just to mitigate my grief. So, it's kind of like, you know, when we're saying you have a realization, then the realization goes. That realization is like, it's like a form of Krishna that just left you. So, you're looking for it. You're lamenting. Oh, last week I was doing so well. So, you imagine you saw Krishna. And Krishna left. You'd be looking. So that's what's happening. So he's looking, he's wondering, he's um, he's trying to get that darshan again. You know, like sometimes you chant really good rounds, and then and then all of a sudden, after the fourth round, you lose it, and you're trying to get back into it, and you can't. So he's like he's like doing that, and he's like trying to get back into. I was seeing Krishna. Or I was, you know, seeing Krishna in the holy name, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, and now I've lost it. In the Vedas it's said that God is beyond the approach of mundane words and intelligence. And yet, by his causeless mercy, one can have suitable senses to hear him or speak to him. This is the Lord's inconceivable energy. 
One upon whom his mercy is bestowed can hear him. The Lord was much pleased with Narada Muni, and therefore the necessary strength was invested in him so that he could hear the Lord. It is not, however, possible for others to perceive directly the touch of the Lord during the probationary stage of regulative devotional service. Bhaiti Sadhana is the probationary stage. <laughs> you know what probation is? Okay. Yeah, maybe. Let's look up the word probation because I only know it in, in terms of the legal context. Let's see. Could be training, but... Um, trial, tryout, audition, experimentation, test, testing. Yeah. When when you're put in jail, sometimes you're let out early on probation, which means you know, like it's a trial. You be, you behave properly, and then so you can do devotional service, but it's not. It's like we're letting you do it, but it's not purified yet. So, try out. So try out's a good word. Okay, try this out. Experiment. Krishna will let you try it out before you're a fully qualified bhakta. Probationary stage. It is not, however, possible for others to perceive directly the touch of the Lord during the probationary stage of regulative, regulative devotional service. In other words, it's, you're not going to see Krishna on the stage of um, lower stages of sadhana. That, you know, when, you, when you're in bhava, then bhava you'll start that will. Bhava is still considered a practice. If you haven't got to prema, which is the Sadhya, the ultimate goal. So even bhava is a practice. And you can fall from bhava. This is not the perfect stage. You can't fall from prema. You can fall from bhava. So it's a very high stage, but it's, it's still considered a practice. But it's, of course, it's, at that stage it's spontaneous. Um, it was a special gift for Narada. When he heard the pleasing words of the Lord, the feelings of separation were to some extent mitigated. A devotee in love with God feels always the pangs of separation and is therefore always enwrapped in transcendental ecstasy. So, to you get any kind of um, darshan of Krishna in the probationary stage of Krishna consciousness is, is generally it's not going to happen but if Krishna wants to give you some taste or some realization through hearing through deity worship through other service of course he can do that and as it's described here it's generally because it's an impetus okay this is you know I'm here just just to let you know I'm here this is it's working you're going to get there and so, no, it's explained in the next verse, or the next verses, why Krishna did that. Because now Krishna's talking to Narada Muni and is explaining why he appeared and disappeared. Antasmin janmani bhavan namham drashtum iharhati avipakva kashayanam turdharshoham Kuyogina. Hmm. Kuyogina. Incomplete. O Narada, the Lord spoke, I regret that during this lifetime you will not be able to see me anymore. Those who are incomplete in service and who are not completely free from all material taints can hardly see me. The Personality of Godhead is described in Bhagavad Gita as the most pure, the supreme, and the absolute truth. There is no trace of a tinge of materiality in his person, and thus one who has the slightest tinge of material affection cannot approach him. 
The beginning of devotional service, service starts from the point when one is freed from at least two forms of material modes, namely passion and ignorance. The result is exhibited by the signs of being freed from kama, lust, and loha, covetousness. That is to say, one must be freed from the desires for sense satisfaction and avarice for sense satisfaction. Attraction and repulsion. The balanced mode of nature is goodness. So you're not, because if you're, if you're repulsed by sense gratification, it means you're attached. So Prabhupada's saying, devotional services really begins from the mode of goodness. Of course, we can take the devotional service anytime, but he's describing here that this is the platform where we will advance. Of course, devotional service will bring you to goodness, and in goodness, you, you become free from dualities, and he uses the word balance. The balanced mode of nature is goodness. So you're not attracted, you're not repulsed. You're free from lust, you're free from lobha, greed. Now you can do devotional service because there's so you know regulative principles. You're free from lust, free from greed. At least if you can follow those, that that's, keeps you more closer to goodness. If you don't follow those, then you're you're helplessly drawn into ignorance and passion, mostly ignorance. And to be completely free from all material tinges is to become free from the mode of goodness also. To search to, in, in the mode of goodness, you're not going to see Krishna. You're, you're closer to Krishna. You'll see him through Shastra, through hearing and so forth, but not full realization won't be there and you won't have darshan. So, mode of goodness is still a material mode, so Prabhupada's saying free from the mode of goodness. It's the free from all material modes. That's Vishuddha Sattva. And then, then you see Krishna. To search the audience of God in a lonely place, in a lonely forest, is considered to be in the mode of goodness. One can go out into the forest to attain spiritual perfection, but that does not mean that one can see the Lord personally there. One must be completely free from all mundane attachment and be situated on the plane of transcendence which alone will help the devotee get in personal touch with the Lord. So again, it's this mechanical thing. It's not, well, if I go to the forest and meditate, then I'll see God. I guess Prabhupada's addressing this point that some people think, again, it's just, it's a meditative process. And that's all you need to do. The Prabhupada's saying, no, you have to be free from material attachment and be situated in transcendence. Then you'll see Krishna transcend the modes of nature. If you if you go out and you do your meditation, your spiritual practice, but your motive is is not pure, then you won't see Krishna. The best method is that one should live in a place where the transcendental form of, of the Lord is worship. The temple of the Lord is a transcendental place, whereas the forest is a materially good habitation. A neophyte devotee is always recommended to worship the deity of the Lord, Archana, rather than to go into the forest to search out the Lord. Devotional service begins from the process of Archana, which is better than going out in the forest. In his present life, which is completely freed from all material hankering, Sri Narada Muni does not go into the forest although he can turn every place into Vaikuntha by his presence only. He now he's talking about his present life. This is after he's purified. So this is later on. He travels from one planet to another to convert men, gods, kinaras, kundharvas, rishis, munis, and all others to become devotees of the Lord. By his activities, he has engaged many devotees like Prahlad Maharaj, Dhruva Maharaj, many others in the transcendental service of the Lord. A pure devotee of the Lord, therefore, follows in the footsteps of the great devotees like Narada and Prahlad and engages his whole time in glorifying the Lord by the process of kirtan. Such a preaching process is transcendental. So now, Prabhupada's making a shift here. He's, he's going from the story which talks about Narada Muni in the forest, and then he shifts into what Narada Muni is doing now 
and, and contrasting this meditative process with the process of a devote of devotee, of what he does or his his service is to help other people. So that that's the real um, transcendental process. Like we were talking yesterday that when when a devotee develops love for Krishna, or even even beginning stages uh, in sadhana. As the affection for Krishna develops, affection, the desire to help other people simultaneously develops. They 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 go together, and that's how his love, his love manifests simultaneously for helping other people. You won't have affection for Krishna and not affection for other people. They go together. Let's read some more. Sakridyad darshitam rupam etat kamaya ten agha matkama shonakai shadhu sharvan munchati rich chayan. O virtuous one, you have only once seen my person, and this is just to increase your desire for me, because the more you hanker for me, the more you will be freed from all material desires. So now Krishna explains to Narada Muni why he appeared to him. He did it out of his mercy to intensify his hankering. And what Krishna will explain here is that he needed to go, Narada Muni needed to go further in his devotional service. And so this would intensify it. And, and what he explains is that the intensity of our service is minimized by the degree of our attachment. So there's like a scale. Right? You have attachment to Krishna and you have attachment to things other than Krishna. So for the attachment to Krishna to go to the top, it, these attachments, have you have to take these things out and then it will go up. Right? And you put more in here. <laughs> then then the, the attachment to Krishna will go down. It's just how it works. It's Krishna is transcendental to the material world. So the more we are connected with the world, the further we are from Krishna. The more we're disconnected because he's not part of this. Well, he is part of it, but in the sense that I'm saying it in, in terms of attachment to it, where we don't see him, then in that sense he's not part of this world. So because he's transcendental to it, if we're too attached to this world, we're, we um, become entangled in it and not transcendental in it. We disconnect from Krishna. So, naturally, as you pull things out of this side of the scale of attachment, then the Krishna side will go up. And so, pure devotee means that there's no more hankering for anything material. Because hankering for material means, okay, that affection, that desire, which in its pure form is for Krishna, is now manifested in something material. So, it can't be pure for Krishna if it's diverted or diluted, alloyed, or we say unalloyed love, if it's uh, alloyed with something for me. And every every attachment and desire, not in relation with Krishna, then is in relation with something I want. It's not like there's a third thing. Even if you think it's a third thing, it's still in relation to you, because you'll get something. Well, no, I'm doing it for my country, but, okay, so you'll have your country, but that will help you. Or you identify with your country, so you, you're helping yourself by helping your country. You identify with your family. You're helping your helping. No, but I'm selflessly. I selflessly serve my family. But you benefit from it. Or, or worst, worst case, if you don't help them, you'll suffer. So in that way, you benefit by not suffering, because they'll be unhappy with you. So, um, pure. So, so naturally, pure love is free from any form of material affection. So Krishna's he's he's trying to intensify the desire for Krishna of Narada Muni. So so as your desire for Krishna intensifies, your material desires minimize. Or as your material desires minimize, your desire for Krishna intensifies. Because the material desire is it dampens 
the intensity of the desire for Krishna. That's all. That's the only reason why our desire for Krishna is not intense and pure, because there are others. We're desiring other things, so it can't be. It's so we say it's it's alloyed. It's not pure. It's like okay, here's it's a, here's a color red, but if you draw purple into it, it becomes brown. So now it's no longer red. So you know you have. If you shoot a sattva and then paint some sattva goon, some rajagun, some tamagun, and then you've colored it, and so it's not pure anymore. So pure love of Krishna is if you shoot a sattva. A living being cannot be vacant of desires. He is not a dead stone. He must be working, thinking, feeling, and willing. But when he thinks, feels, and wills, materially, he becomes entangled. And conversely, when he thinks, feels, and wills, thinks, feels, and wills, for the service of the Lord, he becomes gradually freed from all entanglement. The more a person is engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, the more he acquires a hankering for it. That is the transcendental nature of godly service. Material service has satiation, whereas spiritual service of the Lord has neither satiation nor end. So, what Prabhupada is saying is, let's say you do something materially, material, so it's like chewing gum. You know, so in the beginning it gets better. There's, a, there's an increase in pleasure, and then it goes down. And every, Everything is like chewing gum, and then, therefore we have the example chewing the chewed. Okay, now the flavor is gone. All, all there is is a little scent of the flavor, but you're chewing it, and you're, you know, but the real flavor is gone. If Krishna didn't give us some flavor, we wouldn't do anything. You know, so we, we come into this world to enjoy. So Krishna says, okay, you want to enjoy it. He has to give us some enjoyment. You know, so you get some enjoyment. But but the point Prabhupada's making here is that on the spiritual level, if you do something, there's no satiation, but rather it's getting better. One second. So, um, maybe he's... Hold on a second. Yeah. Um, that, that the spiritual is the opposite. That, that there's not a satiation point, and the more you do it, the more you get a taste for it. So, so ruchi is a stage of bhakti that comes after nishta, and nishta comes after anartha nivritti. So, I like was saying the scale. So... It's like like an example is that you, you cook sweet rice. But your daughter comes and she takes some neem leaves and then she crushes and puts them in the sweet rice. And we don't know the neem leaves are there. They look like raisins to us. So we're eating it and all of a sudden you taste something very bitter within something sweet. So devotional service is sweet, but there's the bitterness of our own consciousness, which is the contamination of the modes of nature. And um, without that, without that, with those anarthas, then you come to ruchi. Then you can taste the pure sweetness of it. And um, you have you have a situation in the material world. Let's say you're doing something, you get tired of it after a while. Even if it's something you like, you don't you won't do it all day. You you need variety, right? So sometimes you love your daughter, but sometimes you'll give your daughter to your husband because. You like you've had enough. You can't, right? And then he'll have enough. He'll give it back to you, right? So, but Mother Yasoda never gives Krishna to Nanda and say, "I can't deal with Krishna anymore. I'm bored with him. He's driving me crazy." It's not because it's spiritual. You see, that will only happen materially. I, you know, or you know, um, I'm tired of serving Krishna. This is. I need a break from serving Krishna. It won't be that way. But rather, it will get better. It will always get better. And just like it's Prabhupada has told us, and Rupa Goswami has told us in Nectar of Devotion, that Krishna is always expanding his beauty. Radharani is always expanding her beauty. So everything's expanding, so it's always better. And, it, and every time you see Krishna, it's like, it's like the first time. 
You know when you're really thirsty and you drink something that's very that you like, your favorite drink? You know, those first few sips are like incredible. So it's like seeing Krishna. It's not exactly like that, but it's like fresh. It's like I've never seen it before. It's new, so it's it's expanding, right? But materially you get used to things. You know, it's very exciting in the beginning, but you get used to it. And no matter how exciting it is, it always comes down to a point where you get used to it and you tend to not appreciate it as much. You know, let's say let's say you bought the finest car made, right? But after a while you'd get used to it. It wouldn't seem as special. It's not going at least it's not gonna feel more special ten years from now than it did when you bought it. So but in devotional service it's the opposite. Right? The more a person is engaged in the transcendental service of the Lord, the more he acquires a hankering for it. That is the transcendental nature of godly service. Material service has satiation, whereas spiritual service of the Lord has neither satiation nor end. One can go on increasing his hankerings for the loving service of the Lord, and yet he will find he will not find satiation or end. So, so it, this is the positive sense. Not not finding satiation is a positive thing. It would sound negative to somebody who didn't understand. Say, well, what you're serving the Lord, and you're saying you're never, you'll not find satiation. What Prabhupada means is you're already satisfied. So in that sense, it doesn't mean you don't you're not satisfied. It just means that you're not satiated. Where the point is, okay, I'm finished with this. That's what he means. Okay, we had enough. No, it'll it'll always you'll always be hungry for it. If you say. After you eat, you say, I'm satiated. But if you if you never were satiated, you could keep eating. So you, if you had an eternal appetite. So that's basically, that's what, what's being said here. You always have an appetite. You always want Krishna. Because that's the nature of the spiritual. And, and the more you understand the nature of the spiritual, the more you understand how bad the material is. Because often, even as devotees, we don't understand how bad the material is because we don't fully realize the spiritual. But when you fully realize the spiritual, this is the nature of the spiritual, that is eternally blissful, ever-increasing, relishable, free from any material inebriety, contamination. And then you start comparing that to the material, and you see the material is, it's not a good product. The spiritual is a good product, not the material. So then it helps you become free from material hankering and desire. Because you really see the material. The material is only created for two reasons. One reason is that the Krishna gives it to us to let us play here. It's our playground. But the real reason is to help us come to our senses about the nature of it. Like he, he he creates it. He, Krishna creates the material in a way that it's so inferior to the spiritual that once you clearly understand the nature of the spiritual, you become detached from the material. And if, if Krishna creates the material too nicely, then when he describes the spiritual, then you'll think, well, the material is also good. I mean, I'm satisfied with it. I may not have a Rolls Royce, I only have an Acura, but I'm satisfied with it. So that's, that's why Krishna doesn't make it so nice. He makes the material world okay, so we don't suffer intensely, but he doesn't make it so nice, at least on the earth, that it becomes a problem that when we hear this about the spiritual, we say, well, my life's nice also, which many people do. They say, well, I'm happy, so why do I need anything more from the spiritual side? So that's a problem. So uh, we were, you know, when you study, what Krishna says um, in Isopanishad, it says, vidya avidya. Chayas, you know, side by side, study of vidya and avidya. So we study the avidya, which is the material energy, material creation. So we study it, and then by studying it, we understand its nature, its inferior nature, what it's consisted of, what its limitations are, what it gives, and what it doesn't give. And then it's like it's like you're looking for a product, and you look at all the features. And then you compare the products. And then, you know, you're thinking, well, this product looks pretty good. And your friend says, no, I found they've just come out with a new product. And it, 
it does this and this and this. And then you say, oh, this is much better. I'm not going to get the other one. I want to get this one. So here are the features of the spiritual world, the spiritual nature. Then when you understand them, say, okay, this is much better than the material, and then you can detach yourself. And that's why, that's why this process of hearing and chanting uh, regularly is so important, because it, it, it's always reminding us of the benefits. Because maya will cater to our material desire and tell us, no, but you know, there's plenty of good things here that you're missing, and you really want them. So why don't you just, you know, your spiritual life's okay, but keep this going also. So she'll try to activate that. So by hearing and chanting, you say, no, that's just an illusion. It's not really that way. And even, even if it is good, the ultimate goal is it produces death, because she'll die and take another birth. So it's not really good. It's not really a deal. It's not really what you want. But here's another product, a spiritual product. And you say, oh yeah, it has more benefits. It, it lasts a lot longer. It will make me a lot happier. That's the idea. Um, so, by intense service of the Lord, one can experience the presence of the Lord transcendentally. Therefore, seeing the Lord means being engaged in His service because His service and His person are identical. So for us, that's how we see Krishna, through service. Service is absolute. We experience His presence in service. The sincere devotee should go on with sincere service of the Lord. The Lord will give proper direction as to how and where it has to be done. There was no material desire in Narada, and yet, just to increase his intense desire for the Lord, he was so advised. So, having no material desire is not the goal. Having intense desire to serve Krishna is both. Because you can come, I mean, many people come to the stage, Brahma Bhuta, so there's no material desire. But it doesn't mean there's any intense desire for Krishna. It's a neutral state. So, it's a spiritual state, but it's not the state we want. So, let's read the next verse. Sat sevaya dhirdha jhapi jata mai dhridha matihi ritva vadhyam imam lokam gantamaj janatham asi by service of the Absolute Truth, even for a few days, a devotee attains firm and fixed intelligence in me. Consequently, he goes on to become my associate in the transcendental world after giving up the present deplorable material worlds. Serving the, serving the Absolute Truth means rendering service unto the Absolute Personality of Godhead under the direction of a bona fide spiritual master who is a transparent via medium between the Lord and the neophyte devotee. The neophyte devotee has no ability to approach the Absolute Personality of Godhead by the strength of his present imperfect material senses and therefore under the direction of the spiritual master he is trained in transcendental service of the Lord. And by such training even for some days the neophyte devotee gets intelligence in such transcendental service which leads him ultimately to get free from perpetual inhabitation in the material worlds and to, to be promoted to the transcendental world to become one of liberated associates of the Lord in the kingdom of God. So, what Prabhupada is saying here is that, that once a devotee, even in a very immature stage, takes guidance from the spiritual master and engages in service, then Krishna starts to give him intelligence. And then, the, then this whole process begins where he can now get out of this material entanglement which he's been in for so long, which seems impossible to get out of. But now Krishna is there guiding him out of this whole maze. And that's why Krishna comes as the super soul to guide us out of this problem. So when we're properly engaged, then we're showing Krishna, okay, this is what I want. I want to get out. So now Krishna guides us out. So that's no longer really a process of us on our own struggling to get out. But it's a process that we've been guided by the spiritual master and from that we get his mercy and Krishna's mercy. So all we have to do is follow those instructions. It's not like it's not like in other yoga processes where you, you need in, intense amounts of discipline and tolerance and you need to do severe austerities, torture your body, and things that nobody can do. 
It requires a lot of your own personal willpower and strength. Not that tolerance is not needed in bhakti, not that willpower is not needed, but the practices of bhakti are not as difficult and in, in simply by pleasing the spiritual master, even if it's something very simple that you do, but the guru is pleased, you get so much mercy. And from that mercy, Krishna's pleased. So Krishna, in a sense, he makes it easy because he doesn't make it hard to please him. And so you simply follow the orders of your guru, follow the orders of the Vaishnavas, follow the orders of Prabhupada, Krishna's pleased. And of Krishna, and then you, Krishna sees, okay, you're trying, so let me help you. And as soon as you find difficulty in, in devotional service, then you're, you're losing Krishna's help because because something has shifted in your consciousness where your intensity or your desire to be Krishna consciousness is weakened. So Krishna's intensity in helping you weakens. It's all proportional. And when you're doing very well in devotional service, it's because, you're, because your desire is strong, so Krishna's helping you. So you're getting a lot of realization, you're getting a lot of inspiration, you're getting a lot of taste. Because Krishna's helping you. Because you want that, like we were talking last night. Krishna is responding. So that's why it can be it can be extremely easy sometimes, and at other times it can be extremely difficult because we're allowing ourselves to become overcome by the modes of nature. And then, if we don't do anything about it, then we stay in those modes. So Krishna, he kind of leaves us according to where our consciousness is. Very reciprocal. So, any questions? Great sages. Great saints and sages. Any questions? The, um, well, for the devotees who are listening now, well, it's, it's come, become so light. I have to change the settings. Hold on. It's too light. It's, it's, could we yes. uh, close that? I just have to see if I can find some settings here. I can, I can. Um, better. Yeah, that's better. Not so bright. Yeah, much better. Made it a little darker. Okay, that's better. So, after class last night, we had a little discussion. Some of you didn't hear, and I was telling the devotees that Krishna, that whatever situation we're in, it's just Krishna's responding to our desire. So, it's, you know, sometimes we, we say Maya is strong, but what's really strong is our desire to be in Maya. Because Maya is also reciprocating. If, if, if Maya is not in the life of someone who doesn't want Maya, it's not like it's not like Maya's job is to keep us in the material world forever. Her job is to keep people who are not qualified to go back to God in the material world. Her job isn't to keep everybody here. It's only to keep people who want to be here. So, we have an animal here in the audience. So, sometimes we think, we'll say, sometimes we'll say Maya is very strong. We'll say Maya is very strong. But what, what's really strong is our desire to be in Maya. That's what's strong. Right? Of course, Krishna is stronger than Maya. So we should, you know, if, if we ever say Maya is strong or, or feel that Maya is strong or powerful, we should be thinking, okay, well, it's my desire to be in Maya that's strong. So, so Maya, just like Krishna, is only reciprocating with, with what we're putting out. And if we put out more Krishna consciousness, then Krishna reciprocates with that desire. But that's just how it works. It's like it's 
Because we have, we came to the material world to be independent of Krishna, so Krishna doesn't interfere with that at all. He only reciprocates with it in any way, in any way we want it. So then you, you'll even you go to the Vedas, and so if you want to succeed materially, the, the Vedas will show you how to do that. That's what you want. Side by side, they'll show you how to get Krishna. If that's what you want. So, um, what, what, what did we just read? Um, Prabhupada said, uh, yeah, neophyte, neophyte devotee gets intelligence in such transcendental service, which leads him ultimately to get free from perpetual inhabitation in the material worlds and to be promoted to the transcendental world, to become one of the liberated associates of the Lord. So, the desire, this desire which Prabhupada is describing here to be an eternal associate of the Lord, to be in relationship with Krishna, this desire, it's there within all of us. It's, so it's, it's, it's not um, like we look at it and we think, well, will I ever come to that stage? Well, that, that is who we are. So it's not an unnatural state. It's not unnatural at some point in our life to come to a point where in, we look at this world and we say, there's nothing in this world for me and the only thing I want is Krishna. That's not unnatural. That's natural. That if you stay in Krishna consciousness, you'll come to that position. You'll come to the position where nothing, even the most attractive things, will have any allurement for you. It's like, it's like if you've had a meal, then, then what anyone brings to you when you're not hungry, even though if it's something you like or it looks good, there's no desire to eat. So you so you'll say, it's nice, but I'm not hungry. So you come to that point in Krishna consciousness where you're so satiated in devotional service that you may look at something and say, well, that's a nice house, or that's a nice dress, or that's a nice car, or that's a nice this or that. But there's no impetus to, to enjoy it. That's the natural condition. It's this, the desire to enjoy things of this world is not at all natural. But in our condition, sometimes we can't imagine ever coming to a state of being that attached to Krishna. But I was thinking this morning, what was I thinking? I was having this thought of the, the intensity. You think of material, any material emotion or desire in, in, in a very intense form. You think of a time in your life you had a very intense desire. Maybe, maybe it's just that you were cold and you just had intense desire to get in a warm place or you were thirsty and you just had an intense desire to drink something. Or you missed somebody you loved and you just had intense desire to see them and they're coming you know, tomorrow and you're, you're hankering. And, you know, and so, so Krishna consciousness means being like that always in relation to Krishna. But it's natural. And so you can understand when you're always like that, then how, how would you at all be connected with the material modes of nature and material desire and hankering? It's just, just everything material is just there. You just see it. It's just there for Krishna's service. It doesn't exist any other way. But when you're not Krishna conscious, then you see everything in duality. It's not for Krishna's service. It's disconnected. There's two things. There's Krishna and there's material energy, and I like material energy. There's God and there's his world. We separate them. But in this other stage of Krishna consciousness, you don't separate it. Because you can't see it separate. You don't, that's not the way you see it. So you don't see material energy separate. So if you only see material things in relation to Krishna, then how can you become attached to enjoying them? Because they're all for Krishna. It's just like... You go in the deity room and there's all this beautiful jewelry. You don't think, well, I look good in that necklace. No, it's obvious it's for Krishna. You don't go in the deity kitchen and think, oh, here's some bananas and mangoes. That looks good. Let's, let's eat something. No, because you see there it's all in relation to Krishna. You go into Krishna's temple. You don't think, oh, I'd like to have that picture hanging on the temple wall. Nobody thinks like that because you see it's all for Krishna. So now imagine you saw the whole world like the deity room or the deity kitchen or the temple. This is all Krishna's temple. Everything's for Krishna. Then you wouldn't be. You wouldn't even think about anything. Everything and every person that's here is for Krishna. So you wouldn't think about enjoying anybody or anything. So that's how the devotees detach because he can't. He no longer can see anything in relation to his own personal enjoyment. 
He only sees it in relation to Krishna. It's all for Krishna. So how would he become attached to it? If he can't use it for Krishna, he has no need for it. And his only need is that he can use it for Krishna. Otherwise. So, so he can get wealth, fame, position. And only if he can use it for Krishna does he have use for it. Otherwise, if he can't use it for Krishna, he doesn't touch it. That's the idea. Very simple, right? So why, why do we, um, why do we become attached? Why do we hanker for things? Because we don't see them in relation. We don't see this is for Krishna. We say, oh, this is for Krishna. And this is for me. So the thing for me is what I'll enjoy. Okay, I'll give that to Krishna. So that's one stage of devotional service, right? That's one stage of devotional service, but um, higher stages, there's no duality. There's no for me, for Krishna, it's all for me. It's all for Krishna. So Prabhupada said, everything for Krishna, nothing for me. Now, if you tell somebody to think that way, even a devotee, sometimes the devotee thinks, well, that's really extreme. A, devo a, devotee, a devotee will think, I think that's like extreme. Everything for Krishna, nothing for me. If nothing for me, how can I be happy? I'll just be miserable. <laughs> that's material thinking. <laughs> nothing for me, everything for God. Oh, that's horrible. But in Krishna consciousness, you, that's how you see. You can't think any other way. You don't see anything as yours. So to think anything for me other than everything for Krishna is a miserable way of thinking for the devotee. But when we're not in a, in a purified state, we think everything for Krishna, oh my God, that full surrender, I'm giving up so much. No, you're not giving up, you're just recognizing it's not yours. But there's this fear we want to you know, identify. Mine, 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 mine. This is things for Krishna here and these are things for me. Like that. So, yes. Okay. Question, yeah. Then when we think, so we think there is so much lust and envy in, within the heart problem. Yes. Uh, so, so much lust and envy in our heart. Yes, as you said, it is only because we, we don't see things as Krishna's. Krishna's yes. But we see, we, we want to enjoy our, there is like cross a certain level. Yeah. So, how, how do we overcome this problem? How do we overcome the desire to enjoy? <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. It's inherent in the process, but it, it works on two levels. One level is you perform the process, and one level is the level of knowledge, that you understand your condition. And you understand why you're in the condition, and then you try to rectify it yourself. So you, you're rectifying it through the practice of vaidhi, but you're also working on your own consciousness, your own attitudes to develop the proper vision. So, so um, knowledge can help you in detachment, but ultimately detachment comes through realization, through practice. So they go together. So the knowledge helps you become better in Krishna consciousness. The Krishna consciousness helps you become more detached. But um, if you're asking, like, right now, what can I do before I come to this higher level of advancement, then um, I think part of it is, un is understanding that these higher levels of Krishna consciousness is what we, as spirit souls, is what we want. Uh, that we don't want these other things. And, and and Krishna is trying to teach us this in the Gita, that we don't want these other things. And these other things don't work. They keep us entangled. And not only do they keep us entangled, we're not even satisfied with them. And then not only that, we're actually tormented by them. So it's also a reminder. It's also to remind yourself that, you know, like you were saying last night, I do something and then I feel remorseful because I know I, I did it wrong. So you want to come to the stage where you just don't do it anymore. So you're remorseful, remorseful, then at some point you, you talk to yourself, you 
you work it out. Say, well, why am I doing this? Why don't I just stop doing this because I'm torturing myself? So then again, it goes back to the point of understanding how material energy is just, it's just that it exists for us to, to not find satisfaction. And so we are just meant to, to acknowledge it. Um, when you're in the mode of passion, you can't acknowledge it. Because in the mode of passion, the desire to enjoy is so strong. You don't acknowledge the suffering. It's very interesting. I don't know if you all know this story, but I'm going to tell you a story. And um, well, there's a question here. Can we judge our progress not on whether we feel good or bad, but how strong our taste or desires? Yes. But you'll feel happy also. But of course you could feel happy for so many wrong reasons. Um, but detachment, yeah, that, that you can't. You're not going to become detached if you're not Krishna conscious. You know, you eat a lot of halava, a lot of sugar, you'll probably feel happy 20 minutes after because the sugar is floating in your brain. And you'll probably start laughing also. But, but detachment is... That's more of a true test. And satisfaction, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So, um, making this point about the material, the material world, it, it, it's there to cause us some kind of frustration so that we become detached and attached to Krishna. But we don't always see it. So, when we're in the mode of goodness, you can see it more easily. In the mode of goodness, you tend to see things as they are, but in passion and ignorance, you don't see them as they are. So when you're in passion, that means your desire to enjoy material things is very strong, so you don't notice so much the difficulties that you undergo. In Bhagavatam, it talks a lot about the grihastas, um, and household life, and how you work very hard, and there's so much pain in this world, of just maintaining the family and so forth and the troubles and tribulations. But but those who are very attached to family life don't see it that way. They don't you know, they only see the nice things. They won't see the, the difficulties. They don't notice that. That's the mode of passion. So you have this story. You know the story of Bilba Mangala Thakur and the prostitute. And so Bilba Mangala Thakur and the prostitute the prostitute was his girlfriend, Prabhupada said. She said she actually it was his girlfriend. Called the prostitute, but Prabhupada said it's the same thing. If one is having sex with his girlfriend, his girlfriend is his prostitute. Just doesn't have to pay her. He pays her by taking her out to the movies. He pays her in different ways, but from from this perspective, she's just a prostitute. And Prabhupada said, prostitute meant girlfriend. So in this story, there's this there's this severe storm. So in in this storm, what's going on? It's, it's, he, he, he's on one side of a river, he has to cross the river, and he shouldn't have been out, it was dangerous. It was a severe storm. But he really wanted to see her, so he goes... So there's so many obstacles he had to go through to see her. The storm alone was a huge obstacle. And then he had to cross the river in the storm, so the river was rapidly moving, it was dangerous, and he caught on to a log which later he realized was a dead body, which is kind of repulsive if you're trying to cross a river and you grab onto a dead body. You know, but he couldn't let go of it. And his mission was to see the prostitute. So he had such an intense desire that it didn't, you know, the weather didn't really bother him, the river didn't really bother him, the dead body didn't really bother him. Then she had locked the gate, so he had to climb over the gate and he grabbed onto a rope. It turned out to be a snake. So he climbed over the gate, the fence, holding onto a snake. The snake didn't bother him. And then he had to jump down over the fence, and you know, and it's all and all this is going on in this intense storm. So he's dripping wet, right? So what's the point? Is the point is that all these difficulties weren't were not were not even noticed by him, because his desire, because he was so much in passion that he didn't notice it. So, in the same way, you see people in the mode of passion, their lives, what are their lives? Their lives, most people's lives are not enjoyable. They have to get up early and go to work. They're working in a job they don't like. Many people come home and then they just have a few hours to drink some beers, go to the beach, do whatever they do. Play cards, watch television. But because they can do that and they can get off on the weekends and whatever, they, they, 
somehow don't notice that all the other things that are going on, and then your home life may not even be happy. Maybe so many troubles with the family and like that. So the point is, when you're in the mode of passion, you don't notice it. You just, your desire to enjoy and be happy is so intense. You just don't notice the suffering. So what Krishna is doing in the Gita, he's trying to point out that no, notice it. You should notice the suffering. It's there. And notice it's there and understand that this is meant to detach you. It's meant to actually help you. But for the person in passion, they can't give up this desire to enjoy. So despite the suffering, they'll keep going on. It's just like an addiction. Right? So if you just come to a little higher stage and just start to notice when, you know, like we were saying last night, sometimes things upset you. People upset you. Situations upset you. And so you can stand back and say, okay, I'm upset by this situation. This is the nature of this world. Things are upsetting. And when I get upset, now I'm very disturbed. And it's like self-inflicted pain. So this is, the, this is the nature of this world, that I'm inflicting pain on myself, and now I keep inflicting pain on myself, and this is what life is about? Then you start to think about it and say, no, this, is, this can't be what life is about. This, this is not what life is for. I need to transcend. I need to advance spiritually. So I stop inflicting pain on myself. I'm depriving myself of the pleasure of my own spiritual realization by inflicting my pain on myself because of material tribulation and attachment and material hankering. So, so in our stage now, we're at least supposed to view things that way. And if things don't work out well in our life, we're supposed to think, okay, Krishna's moving me closer to him in some way, and then it's good. It, it, in other words, for us as devotees, we only need things to work out so in our life well so we can engage in devotional service, so we can be more of service to Krishna. That's like, we don't like to get sick, because if we get sick, then it inhibits our service. And, but if somehow we get sick, we'll take it, okay, Krishna is getting me sick to detach me from the body, to show me that, you know, this is, I asked for this body, now look what this body is doing. It's, it's causing pain, it's causing trouble, it's causing me um, to be uncomfortable. It's costing me money now to repair the body, so to speak. So, we're supposed to see it that way. But when passion, we just see how can I cure myself? And then I cure myself and I say, oh, I feel great. And we kind of forget the lesson of, no, the body's not great. When I, I've told this a story before that in Vrindavan, when they opened the temple, they had fans in the temple. It was very hot. It was in April. It was really hot. So, of course, the fans were cooling us off and Prabhupada said that, you know, you think the fans are nice. He said, but actually, actually, the way you should see it is that things are not nice, therefore you need a fan. So, you, you, know, you know, we're like, well, I have air conditioning, so I feel good. But, but from the spiritual perspective, we say, no, the, it's too hot, it's uncomfortable. The, the material, it's uncomfortable here, it's not pleasant. And in the winter, it's very cold, it's not pleasant. So, but I have heat, so I'm comfortable. But no, but see the actual nature of the world. But if you're in passion, you think, oh, I feel so comfortable, I have air conditioning on, and drinking a beer and relaxing with my friends, I feel good. But the transcendental vision is, no, there's suffering in the world. You see? So, so that's the way we're meant to see it. But if we get too attached to enjoying, who wants to think about suffering if you want to enjoy? Yeah. Okay, it's cool inside, I'm drinking a beer, having a good time. I don't want somebody knocking on my door and saying, hey, this world is miserable. Take, read this Bhagavad Gita. You're not actually happy here drinking your beer, hanging out with your friends. This is not happiness. You, you don't want to hear that. You want to focus on happiness. You don't want to think about the fact that you're going to go to work on Monday. You don't like your job. You're going to have to get up early. You don't want to think about the bills you can't pay, the problems you have with your wife or family. You just want to now zone into ignorance and a little, you know, isolate yourself in this little world of beer and relaxing on a Saturday, so everything is good. You want to forget all those other things. So, material life means you have to forget the miseries 
because if you if you're too conscious of them, then you can't enjoy. It's like like yesterday I had I had a headache and it was so intense, I couldn't really focus, right? So I have to get rid of the headache so I can focus. So you know, material misery is just a headache, and we can't focus on our enjoyment if we have. So we want to just take aspirins to get rid of it. Aspirin is sense gratification. And we forget about the material misery. And if you can forget, the better you are at forgetting about your misery, the happier you are. And really happiness is just the process of forgetting. And you don't, you know, you don't want to remember it. So, what do you all think out there? Is that true? It's as, it's as a subtle psychology, but, but you'll find that as you advance in Krishna consciousness, then you'll think differently. The realizations you said are good from The realizations? When we hear, we get the... When we hear, we get realizations. But the realization won't last long because there is a desire to oh, yeah. en enjoy. So I'm saying... Sometimes they're real, we get realizations, but they don't last because we're not on that same stage of consciousness when we got them. It's like sometimes you're doing better in Krishna consciousness than you get realization. But if you don't stay on that level, you lose the realization. But when you advance so that you're steadily on one level, those realizations will remain because now you're steady. So there, you know, there are different levels of which you can be steady on. So you can come to a north and a vritti, be steady there, but you're not steady on ruchi, but doesn't mean you won't have ruchi. Sometimes, but it's, you won't always have it. You'll have it more, and nishta is right next to ruchi, so you'll have it more, but in ruchi you'll always have it. And even on nishta, sometimes you might be steady internally, but externally in your behavior might not be steady. You may, maybe internally your consciousness is free from material desire. Well, as Prabhupada said, 75% in the vritti. But externally, maybe you're you, know, you don't get all your rounds done early in the morning every day, you don't always get up early, or you're not so regulated, that that you're still not, you may not still be completely steady, but when Ruchi and Masakti will come, then you're, you're so attached to Krishna and you have so much taste that steadiness is just a byproduct. So it's a different level. And each stage is a different level. Right? So then when... When we talk about going to these different levels, it means it doesn't mean that there are no symptoms of the higher levels on the lower levels. It just means the symptoms don't remain. They come and go. It doesn't mean that you don't experience ecstasy in devotional service if you're not on the stage of bhava. It just means it comes and goes. You, you do something and you feel very ecstatic doing it, but it doesn't remain. You'll come down to the level that you're on. So as you come to higher levels, your realizations will remain steady. So now if you want to if you want to stay on a higher level, then you have to have very good sadhana because then it keeps you on that level. Because you're not really on that level, but the sadhana keeps you there. And if you lose the sadhana you go down. But when you reach a higher level, then if your sadhana is not so perfect, but still you'll tend to stay on that level because that's your level of realization. Not that you can't fall down if you neglect sadhana, but it will be more drastically noticed on lower stages. Like I've said, in you know, higher stages you don't have to follow the principles, but you follow them anyway because that's, they're kind of, you're just following them for a different reason, because you want to, not because you have to. But the, the principles are just natural practices, chanting, hearing, and so forth. So you, so it's not even, you know, it's no longer a problem of following them. It's just, that's your lifestyle. So, if it's not your lifestyle, then you do it by the rule. Then you, it keeps you on a higher level. But without the rules, you wouldn't do it, perhaps. But on a higher level, you don't need the rules. Because you, you, that's who you are now. That's what you do. And aside from that, the holy name in kirtan and japa will give all kinds of realizations because the holy name, if we're chanting well, it, we could we take, we take ourselves from a very low level and very quickly can put us on a transcendental level. So that, therefore, when we chant good rounds, we get a lot of realization. And when we don't chant good rounds, we tend to not get those realizations. 
right? Carolina says, what are the signs that let us know we are advancing in our spiritual life? Losing interest in material things and becoming attached, becoming having more of a taste for spiritual things. The same same question that Timothy is asking. That, that in um, I think Jiva Goswami in one of the Sandarbhas he said that you know, sometimes people they imitate ecstasy. And 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 Jiva Goswami says you, you can't evaluate a person's spiritual status by these external symptoms because they can be faked. You could even fake yourself out. But he said, as I was telling Timothy, what one thing you can't fake is detachment. And ultimately you can't fake attachment to Krishna, but particularly detachment. So, how do you evaluate a person's level of advancement? You can't evaluate it perfectly because they apparently exhibit ecstatic symptoms, crying and so forth. But you can evaluate it by their disinterest in material things, by their detachment. You can evaluate it that way. So, detachment from material things is a sign that you're becoming attached to Krishna, a sign that, and being becoming attached to Krishna is a sign that you're advancing. So advancement, it's not sentimental. I, I, I feel Krishna conscious. Well, how do you know it's Krishna consciousness? Well, you know it because you're losing interest in material things. So there's, there's feeling, but there's science to back up the feeling. You know, I feel happy in Krishna consciousness. How come? Well, I put marijuana in my cookies, so I feel happy in my spiritual life. Okay. That's, you can feel, like I'm saying, there may be many things that make you happy. Right? That may not be genuinely spiritual. But if detachment is there, yes. But still, I'm not saying that, that it's not a symptom of Krishna consciousness that you feel happy. Normally it is a symptom that you feel happy. But sometimes you may be in very difficult situations, and so you may be like in anxiety and stress. And that may also be Krishna consciousness, because you're, you're taking on anxiety for Krishna. But ultimately you'll, you'll feel happy at the end of the day that you did your service. Um, inspiration is another thing, enthusiasm. That you're, you're enthusiastic to serve. That's another sign. But Prabhupada... Prabhupada gives this example, you know, you have a disease, and so you take your temperature. So, so material, maya, is, if we're in maya, we have a temperature. So how do you know you're not in maya? Take your temperature. And what's the temperature? What is that temperature? It means the um, attraction to material nature. That's the temperature. That's what, that's how Prabhupada explained it. Yeah. I mean, it's actually very simple. Becoming more attached to Krishna, more attracted to things in relation to Krishna, and more detached from Maya. Let's say, Carolina, you have a boyfriend, but you're not really sure whether you should marry him. And there's another boy who's kind of come into your life, which is making you more uncertain about marrying this other boy, because this other boy seems to be more or this other man seems to be more of your style and nature and you feel happier with him and more satisfied whenever. So in trying in trying to understand who you should marry, then you might say things like, Well, with my boyfriend I I don't I don't like being with him that much. I but with this other I really like being with him. So detachment, attachment, you know, really Something about him that attracts me. I feel good in his presence. I feel good about myself. I do better when I'm with him. And when I'm with my other friend, I, my other boyfriend, I, we just fight and I don't feel happy. And, you know, so, it's, so how do you know you're Krishna conscious? Well, the, the new boyfriend is Krishna. The old boyfriend is mine. You know. I'm feeling happy. I'm feeling satisfied. I'm not... Um, going around this world envious of what other people have, lamenting that I don't have what they have, jealous of other people. like that. That's how you know you're advancing. And so, whenever you see these other material signs, then you take heed that I need, there's work I need to be done. It's just, it's just a red flag Krishna's showing you. I have a tendency to criticize lately. Oh, that's a sign that maybe something is 
lacking in my japa or my spiritual practice. Otherwise, why this tendency is coming? Maybe I made some offense to somebody and it's causing me, causing my consciousness to go down. You always want to backtrack if you see a problem. Let's backtrack a little bit. Okay? That's good? Maya is not attractive. Although she's very attractive, but actually she's not. Because if you see through Maya, everything in this world leads you to death. Well, it leads you to old age death in another body. So if you see all the so-called attractive things as ultimately just producing death, then it's not attractive in them. And the Prabhupada tells a story. They had these women, they're called Vishakanya, and, and Visha means poison. And they're actually employed by the king as weapons to kill men. And what they would do is when they were very young, they'd be given very minute amounts of poison, gradually, and a little more and more. And so they, their bodies could tolerate the poison. They built a tolerance up to it. Just like, like they say when you have children, children um, put things in their mouth, dirty things, and sometimes they say it's okay because they're building up resistance. If you, if you prevent them from touching anything or putting anything in their mouth, they, their bodies won't build up resistance to foreign elements. So I said, it's okay, let them they give a little poison like that. So they built up this immunity to poison, so their bodies became poisonous. And then they would send these women, they were very beautiful, and the women would allure the opposing kings and princes and like that, and when they would kiss them, it would poison the king, and he would eventually poison the person they kissed, and eventually they would die. So you can see the whole material world is like the Visha Kanya. It's like everything, everything ultimately leads to that. So that's how we're supposed to see it. And that keeps us detached. You know, what, what, of what benefit is in this world? Okay, there's so many things of temporary benefit which we can utilize in Krishna's service or utilize to maintain ourselves, to keep ourselves healthy and comfortable and so on. But what's the ultimate benefit of all this? It's just producing death. That's where it takes us. So you see something very beautiful, something you're hankering for, something you really want. Okay, that's okay. Can you use it for Krishna? Because if you can't, it's just leading you to another body. It's leading you away from Krishna. It's, it's separating you further from Krishna. And you don't want that. Everything can be used. Practically anything can be used. But that's how we see it. And if we don't see it how it can be used, then it should have no relevance to us. Like you go into a store, you, you buy what you need. You don't buy what you don't need. So we should be that way in Krishna consciousness. Buy what you need. And if you don't need it, don't buy it. Right? Does that make sense? So, the material world is like one big Walmart. So just take what you need and use it for Krishna. And whatever you don't need, just don't buy it. Because it's just a burden. That's so that's how we see things when we're not on this transcendental level. But someday all of you out there in Mayapur TV land and everywhere else who's listening to this lecture, someday you're gonna come to a point in your life where you're gonna look at everything in this world and say, There's nothing I want here. There's nothing I, I have no attachment. If I can't use it for Krishna, I don't want it. You'll come to the, because that's where Krishna consciousness will take you. And it's not something you should be afraid of. It's something you should look forward to because that will only come because of your attachment to Krishna and you'll be millions of times more blissful and happy. But somehow or other we're afraid to come to that situation because we think, well, how will I be happy? No, it's not that you don't have a car and a house and a husband and a wife and money in the bank and, and this and that, but now it's there's no attachment. It's just you use it for Krishna. It's a completely different. But when you have all these things and you're trying to enjoy them, that's where all the conflict comes in and all the upset comes in because you can't enjoy it perfectly all the time. Right? <laughs>